Hey, I'm Hans Hess. Thanks for watching my television program. Such a blessing, such an honor to come to you and preach the Word of God. I have a fire in my heart to win as many people to Jesus as I can before I leave here. I feel like the house is on fire and I'm trying to rescue folks out of the fire. So thanks for watching today. We're going to get into the scripture and I want you to open up your mind and open up your heart. Take just a few minutes and listen to what I have to say and allow God to speak to you today. Believe God. Elevate your faith today as you listen and believe God for great things. Open your Bibles with me to Job chapter 33. Job chapter 33. I've been preaching for now, this makes four weeks, on hearing the voice of God. And I was going to just finish this last week, but I thought, there's one more thing I want to deal with, and I've never really preached on it as a, a, a sole subject, okay? I've not preached on this alone, and it's about our dreams. And I want to talk to you about how God can speak to us through dreams. And this is more teaching than preaching. And uh, years ago, I was in a lecture by a great New Testament Greek scholar named Gordon Fee, and he gave the definition well, he gave the difference between preaching and teaching. You know what it is, don't you? It's just the level of volume you speak at. So, you know, anywho. Job 33, verse 15. Listen, this is a profound passage. This is a profound passage if you've never seen this before. Job 33, verse, thir verse 15. For God may speak in one way or in another. Yet man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and seals their instruction in order, here's the purpose, in order to turn man from his deed and conceal pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. Isn't that powerful? So scientists have proven that everyone dreams one to two hours each night. This occurs during a certain period of sleep known as alpha level sleep, which is light sleep. And alpha level sleep is where one has what is called REM or rapid eye movement. So rapid eye movement is exactly what it sounds like. The eyes of the dreamer begin moving rapidly and he is actually watching the scenes in the dream and thus his eyes are literally moving back and forth observing the action. By observing the alpha level sleep when rapid eye movement occurs, researchers in sleep laboratories have determined when a person is dreaming and how much time on average is spent each night dreaming. So, dream comes in cycles, or, or sleep rather, comes in cycles. So at the close of your first 90 minutes or so of sleep cycle, the individual returns to this alpha level where he has a short five-minute dream period. Then the next time he cycles up to alpha, he has an, a more extended, maybe 10-minute dream period. And the third time he cycles back to alpha, the dream period is even greater, maybe 15 minutes or so. So if one sleeps a full eight hours, the entire last hour is essentially spent in alpha-level dream sleep. Thus, a person who sleeps average of eight hours a night will dream maybe one to two hours of that time. And so they've discovered if they awaken a person during the, RE, during the time when REM begins, preventing that person from dreaming, about three nights of this, the individual starts to show signs of having a nervous breakdown. Because clearly dreams are an inner release mechanism that helps provide us with emotional balance and maintain our sanity. Dreams can be considered guardians of our mental and emotional state. 
And so dreams are often the brain working out issues and processing things that you're dealing with in life. So, you know, I have friends who kind of believe God is speaking to us all the time in dreams. Uh, I could be wrong, but I'm not one of those. I hear, I'm just going to give you what I believe, and if I change my line, mind later, I'll come back and preach another sermon. Amen. <laughs> I believe that we dream often, and it's our mind working overtime, processing dealing with seeing stuff that's going on in our lives. Number two, though, even though every dream, to my knowledge, every dream mentioned in the Bible was a dream from God. And because of that, there are some people who teach on dreams who believe Satan can't enter the dream realm. I'm not one of those. I believe Satan can attack you at night as well. Okay, so, so, so we have you yourself are processing issues and dealing with issues at night. Number two, demonic spirits can attack you at night. Number three, God can speak too. God can speak to you in dreams as well. And we see this all throughout the Bible. I'm telling you from Genesis to Revelation. In Revelation, John's having visions. So from Genesis to Revelation is God speaking in dreams and visions. Amen? One person said, if you total up all of the dreams in the Bible, the content of it would take up about one-third of the New Testament, or one-third of the Bible, about the size of the New Testament. But God promised us that He would speak to us in dreams, didn't He? He said in Numbers 12, 6, Listen to my words, where there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions I speak to them in dreams. Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And I just want to give a you know, caveat to that. If you're dreaming dreams, it doesn't necessarily mean you're an old man. <laughs> At least I hope it doesn't. But God gives us free counseling in our dreams. This is counseling you don't have to pay for. Psalm 16, 7. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. And I think something is happening here when we're in, in dream state that I think God can bypass defenses that we've built up mentally or in our soul realm. God can bypass those defenses and speak to us directly. As I said, I think it was last week, sometimes God has to bypass my mind, though he's using the mind in some way, but he bypasses the awake cons and speaks to me in dreams a lot. Listen to Job 33 in the NIV. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on people, as they slumber in their beds, he may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings. Sometimes dreams are scary, and just because they're scary doesn't always mean they're demonic. It can be God shaking you so that you will remember something in a dream or warn you of something in a dream to terrify them with warnings, to turn them from wrongdoing, and to keep them from pride. God can bypass the pride we have built up in our souls in the dream state. So to preserve them from the pit, their lives from perishing by the sword. You know, dreams sometimes seem so real. I had someone tell me this week, I told them I was preaching about, they said, man, I dreamed one night that, that I got stabbed in the chest with a knife. And I woke up in the morning and ran to the bathroom and pulled my shirt up and looked in the mirror. I'm not asking to raise hands if you've done that. But dreams seem so real. It's like, oh my gosh, did this really happen? You know, Isaiah referenced this in Isaiah 29, talking about uh, you know, the prophetic Israel and everything. He said, when the hordes come and attack, 
It will be as it was with a dream, with a vision in the night, as when a hungry person dreams of eating but awakes and is still hungry. Or a thirsty person dreams of drinking but awakes and they're still thirsty. Have you dreamed of eating that banana split? And you woke up, you're like, shoot. Can I get back to, can I fall asleep again, Lord, and get right back to that? There's three things I want you to think about, and I'm going to talk about this all through the sermon this morning. There are three things I want you to think about in dreams. Number one is the context. Number two is symbols. And number three is actions. Every dream has a context. And the context is your life. What are you going through in your life? What decisions? Where are you? What position do you have? There's, there's a context to our lives and dreams. We see that in the Bible, definitely. Number two, God usually speaks in symbols in dreams. We'll see this biblically as well. He speaks in symbols. So there may be symbols in your dreams. There may be cars. There may be people. There may be colors. There may be numbers. There may be whatever. And then finally, there are actions in dreams. Some key action or actions are happening. And I want you to start thinking about this as you dream. All right? Everybody good? I'm going to give you three purposes of dreams this morning. Three purposes of dreams. Number one, dreams come to encourage. God can speak encouragement through our dreams. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis chapter 37, there's a man named Jacob. He has 12 sons. His second to youngest son is named Joseph. And Joseph was his favorite. He kind of paid more attention to Joseph. He loved him. He even made him a special coat, unlike the rest of the, the boys. And his brothers despised him for this because he was the favorite. So Joseph had two dreams back to back. Well, in one dream, he saw 11 sheaves in a field standing up and bowing to his sheep. Then he had another dream where he saw 11 stars in the heaven making obeisance, the Bible says, like aligning and reverencing him, and even the sun and moon reverencing him. So let's get the context. The context was he was hated by his brothers, favorite son of his dad. The symbols are sheaves and stars and sun and moon. And the action was they were all bowing to him. So what did, what did Joseph do? He went and told everyone his dreams. <laughs> Big mistake, right? He went and told everyone his dreams, and so his brothers just hated him all the more. And then one day his dad sent him out in the field to check on his brothers. And, by the, and when he got there, his brothers saw him coming from afar, and they said, here comes the dreamer. They hated him. And despised him for his dreams. And so what happened when he came to them, they were talking of killing him. And you know he can hear this. So one brother talks him out of actually killing him. And so they take his coat off of him. They kill an animal and rub the blood on his coat. Go back and tell the dad that he had been mauled by wild animals and killed. And they throw him in a pit. And then these slave traders come along and they sell him into slavery. He's sold into slavery. He's bought by a, an Egyptian official named Potiphar. He becomes great in Potiphar's house, but then Potiphar's wife was lusting after him. She tried to pull him in bed with her. He was a man of integrity. He wouldn't do it, so he ran away, but she ripped off his outer garment as he was running away. And then she cries out, Look, this man tried to rape me. And because of that, he was thrown in prison. Then he's in prison and he, in, he, he becomes the head guy. He becomes like the, the main man in the prison. And then he meets a butler, a royal butler and a royal baker. And they have dreams and he interprets both of their dreams. The baker gets his head taken off. The butler returns to service under the Pharaoh and he's forgotten about in prison. So he's been betrayed or forgotten about or in a bad predicament over and over and over. And I thought, why is this? Why did God give him those dreams? Why did God give him the dream about the sheaves in the field? Why did God give him the dreams about the stars and the sun and moon? I think, number one, God gave them to him to encourage him. 
Why? Because maybe, just maybe, when he was betrayed by his brothers, he's in the pit all alone thinking about hearing his brothers conspiring to kill him. And maybe he thought back to the dreams. God, there's a purpose for me. And you're going to bring this around for your good somehow. I remember the dreams I had. Maybe when he was betrayed by Potiphar's wife and was placed in prison, maybe on the, on the first days there, he's thinking back, God, why did I have those dreams? Something good's got to come out of this. And it encouraged him. Then when he was forgotten about by the butler and baker, maybe he's thinking that again. God, here I am. And these guys, the one guy went back to the Pharaoh and I'm forgotten here. But I know you gave me some dreams and I know they're significant, Lord. And it encouraged him in his walk. Another, another issue that we see in, in dreams is often a prophetic glimpse of what's to come in the future. And I think by the end of this whole scenario, when his brothers actually did come back and, and he revealed himself to them, then the dreams were absolutely fulfilled to perfection. Not only did they encourage him, but they came, there was a prophetic glimpse happening in them. How many of those dreams encourage you? The book of Judges, chapter 7. Gideon and his men are getting ready to attack the Midianites, and they're kind of fearful. They see the Midianites all scattered out, and Gideon walks into his own camp one night, and he hears a man telling his friend, Hey, I had a dream. A round loaf of barley bread came tumbling into the Midianite camp, and it struck the tent with such force that the tent overturned and collapsed. As soon as Gideon heard that, he was like, we've got this battle. He knew, what's the context? They're getting ready to attack the Midianites. What's the symbol? The symbol was the barley loaf. What's the action? The barley loaf destroyed the Midianite camp. He knew God was giving him the victory. And sure enough, God instantly gave him the victory the next day. Oh, hallelujah. God comes and can speak great encouragement to you in our dreams. So many of y'all know last year I lost my wife in, Ju in July, and many of us walked that, many of y'all walked with us through that struggle. And after she passed away, you know, my daughters had specific dreams or visions of their mom. And it was really powerful. They were powerful. And they told them to me, and we were like rejoicing over all of it. But I will confess, I had a little bit of like jealousy because I was dreaming nothing about her. And right or wrong, I prayed. Last year, I prayed and said, Lord, could you show me something in a dream? And it was a long time. I think it was November. I have it written down somewhere. It was November, but in November, I had a dream. And I know it was a God dream. I know it wasn't too much Little Caesars. <laughs> but one night, I dreamed I was at my mom and dad's house, and I was with uh, my brother-in-law. He was standing next to me. And we were in the driveway with a bunch of cars, and a car pulled up on the, on the hill, because my mom and dad live on a hill. A car pulled up on the hill. It was all white, and it was like a Rolls Royce or something. It wasn't a Rolls Royce, but it was like one. And there was a chauffeur in the front, but I couldn't discern the face of the chauffeur. Now, a real prophetic friend of mine says, if you can't discern someone in a dream, it's often the Holy Spirit. But they pull up, and I look in the back, and being chauffeured is Jackie. And we looked at each other, and she stepped out of the car, and we didn't speak a word, and she walked up to me and hugged me and left. I knew, it, I knew two things. Number one, she was okay. And number two, I knew it was a goodbye. But it encouraged me. I didn't have to write that dream down. It's like it was yesterday. Sometimes God comes and I think just says, I'm going to drop some serious encouragement into your life right now. Amen. Can somebody shout amen? amen? Dreams can be encouragement to you. Second thing, God gives dreams sometimes to warn us. In Genesis 41, in the story of Joseph, Pharaoh, the king of all of Egypt, had two dreams back to back. In this dream, in one of the dreams, he saw uh, heads of grain in the field being full and plump and ready to harvest. 
And he saw seven of them. And then he saw seven brittle and decrepit and sickly looking stalks. Then he had another dream where he saw seven cows and they were fat and plump and ready to butcher. Then he saw seven other cows that were diseased looking and thin. And, and, and in the dream, the good stuff ate up the, I mean the bad stuff ate up the good stuff. So context, context is Pharaoh is the king of Egypt. He's over everything. The, the, the symbols were the, the, the heads of grain, the stalks of grain, the cows, and the, and the number seven. And then the action was the bad ate up the good. So he's there, who can interpret my dream? And the butler remembered, oh, there's this guy in prison named Joseph, and God gives him the interpretation of dreams. So they called Joseph out, and Joseph interpreted it for him. He said, Pharaoh, here's what's happening. You're going to have seven plenteous years. There are going to be seven years that you're going to have a great harvest and cattle and everything's going to be great. But then following that, seven bad years or seven years of drought and famine are going to follow. So you better get things in order. And he says, okay, you're the man. And he chooses Joseph to be the second in command of all of the kingdom. And for seven years, Joseph builds storehouses, stores up and gets ready for the bad years. The bad years come and he brings all of Egypt through the bad years because of the interpretation of a dream that God sent to warn a pagan king. And that's just one level of interpretation. On another level, God is preserving His covenant people. That's why Joseph was in the place he was in at the time. That will preach. He was in the place he was at at the time so God could use him to interpret a dream that would mean his family would be taken care of in the future, which would mean the covenant promise of God would not die, but would make it to another generation. Come on, look at somebody next to you and say, there's a reason why you are where you are. Matthew chapter 27, Pilate had, Jesus had come before Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. And the trial had begun and they took a break and you know he sent him back to Herod and so forth. And then Pilate comes back and was sitting in his judgment seat and his wife, who also would have been a pagan Roman girl, sent him a message saying, don't have anything to do with that innocent man, meaning Jesus, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Think about that. God was warning the wife in a dream to tell Pilate not to touch Jesus. But he didn't do it. He still condemned him to death. Genesis chapter 31. If you know the story between Jacob and Rachel and Leah and, and the father-in-law Laban. Jacob worked for years for these two women, 14 years, and then he finally kind of gathered his own flock and fled out of town. And when he did that, no one knew it, but his wife Rachel had held back the family pagan gods, the little idols, from her father's house. When her father found out about it, he went in hot pursuit after them. And then as they're in hot pursuit, I'm sure camping at night, God speaks to Laban in a dream. This pagan man from southern Mesopotamia, he speaks to him in a drink. And he says this, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. And I think what he's saying is, listen, I'm warning you. Don't mess with him. Let the conversation go as it flows. Don't mess with him. And what did they do? They made an agreement not to touch one another and to part ways. And they say, we used to say this as a blessing in church. May the Lord watch between me and thee as we're absent from one another. That was actually like, you know what they were actually saying? Don't you dare cross my line. And I won't cross your line. And the Lord watch between us. Because we're going to get into it if you... Just like we used to sing, they run on the city, they run over the wall. Great is the army that carries out God's word. It's actually a prophetic picture of the hordes coming to destroy Israel. Somebody shout amen. amen. Context in songs is important too. 
God can warn you in dreams. He can warn you. He can, he can okay, this, I'm, I'm going to tell my dreams today because if I have examples, it's like, it's me. So I'm just going to tell my dreams. I was pastoring in Northern Virginia years ago. And uh, I think it was near the, getting close to the time I was going to leave. I didn't know that. But one night I had a dream. And I took it as a warning. In this dream, I was in a car stuck in traffic. The traffic was not moving. There was all kinds of cars around me. Black birds go by in the sky. And in the dream, I said, oh, no. It's a sign the Lord's going to return. And an urgency hit me. And I opened my car door and I ran through the traffic banging on everyone's window and those who rolled down their window, I told them they better get their heart right because Jesus is coming. And as I was doing that, I looked and in the sky, it was like the credits at the end of a movie that started rolling upwards. And at first I saw the crown, the crown on his head. Then I saw the face of Jesus and then the rest of him appeared and the Lord was returning. It's the way it appeared to me in a dream. It's the way it appeared to me in a dream. Praise God. Thank you for listening today and thank you for opening up your heart to hear the Word of God. Listen, I want to pray for you quickly before we go off the air here. If you have any needs in your life or if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, I really want to see you make it to heaven. I want to see you finish this race well. Amen. God has provided the greatest gift of all history. That is, He gave us His Son that, who would die for us so that we wouldn't have to face eternity without God. So if you've never accepted Christ into your heart, let's start there today. Then I'm going to pray for healing and other needs in your life. So just pray this with me. Father, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Forgive me of all sin and become the Lord of my life, Lord Jesus. In your name, I pray. Now I'm going to pray for your needs. Father, in the name of Jesus, for those who are struggling in their body, struggling in their minds, Lord, I pray that you minister to them right now. I pray that you touch them by the power of your Holy Spirit. We bind every demonic influence in their life that's attacking them, and we cast it out, and we just declare the glory of God and victory of God in their hearts right now. In the name of Jesus, be set free by the power of God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for watching us. Go in victory and give God the praise. Oh, James, he's gonna come.